But turn your Bibles over to Luke 16. Luke 16. You know, Pastor Cobb asked me to preach a couple of days ago, and I, I really didn't. You know, I have a list of sermons I might or might not preach, or things that topics that I'm interested in, and I went through them, and none of them really piqued my interest this time. I mean, they, they piqued my interest overall, but I just feel like, oh, these need a little bit more work, or I need to study more. And I was just praying about what I should pray, uh, what I should preach about, and it, I found it there in Luke 16. It's just a topic that that really stands out to me because of the way it was taught to me previously, and the way the Bible just clears it up. But if you'll turn there to Luke 16. Let's read the scripture first, and then uh, I'll give you the title of the sermon this afternoon. Uh, But if you're there in Luke 16, and we start there in verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gates full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass... That the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good, good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And the title of the message or the sermon this afternoon is, Neither Can They Pass to Us. Neither Can They Pass to Us. And we find that uh, there in verse 26, he says, And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fix, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from them. So neither can they pass to us. And the, so, you know, it's a subject that uh, is maybe understood. It's a subject that people have talked about growing up in the church. But there is an attack on hell. You know, there is an attack on the doctrine of hell, the belief that hell is an actual real place. As a matter of fact, if you do a study on where you know people believe that we got the doctrine of hell they think that it's the catholic church introduced it to compensate for you know such a just god and to for the bad people in this world there's all kinds of garbage out there but what does the bible tell us about hell see the challenge is the reason that i i want to preach on hell and the reason we're going to preach on uh such a severe punishment is because number one the lord jesus christ preached more on hell than he did on heaven you know heaven's a great place heaven's where there's going to be no more tears nor sorrow. There's not going to be any more suffering. So everybody wants to talk about the positive. But nobody wants to address the negative. You know, just recently, an idiot uh, football player by the name of Aaron Rodgers got up and interviewed. And he said that he used to be a Christian, but he's not. Well, first of all, you either are a Christian or you're not. You're, not, you're either saved or you're not. You can't just go from one or the other. And second of all, he said that in there, he couldn't, the reason that he want, didn't, believer that he was a Christian anymore is he couldn't believe in a God that could be so cruel and unjust that he would send people to a fire hell for all eternity. Well, the Bible tells us that God didn't want the wicked to perish. You know, he, he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, more loving than sending your own son to die for the sins of the world, nothing can compare to that, the Bible tells us. But people don't have a healthy view on hell and they don't have a healthy fear of God because the world, Satan, has been trying to destroy this doctrine for a long time. You know, the way that I was taught, and, and I could have picked, there's so many sir, I mean, uh, so many uh, scriptures in the Bible that speak of hell. It will, this won't be the last time I preach on hell. I mean, the Bible references as a pit, as a place of uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth, everlasting fire, torment, where the worm never, uh, worm never uh, dieth. I mean, there's just so many references to hell in the old and in the new testament 
But the reason I chose this one specifically is, you know, I, I always say, oh, I feel bad. I'm picking on the, or I don't say I feel bad, but I say not today I'm picking on the Adventist or I'm picking on such religion or whatnot. But the more you read the Bible, it doesn't even become a picking. It becomes a fight. You know, I have a thing against false religions because they teach stuff from the Bible incorrectly. They corrupt the word of God. You know, one of the things that, that and I, I found out, I didn't know it was just the Adventists, but many religions teach that this is a parable. That this is just something, an example that God gave us to explain some other thing. First of all, if it's a parable, well, still, that's pretty serious, right? There's, if, the, if it was a parable, we could take the parable and say, look, there's consequences to your actions. And one of them is a fiery hell in all eternity. So even if it was a parable, that's still a pretty bad consequence for rejecting Jesus Christ on earth. And so we're just going to dissect this. We're going to take it through, and if you know, if you were to read all of Luke 16, you know, it talks about the steward who, uh, the bad steward who went and he fixed everybody's debts, and, and the rich man was impressed with, uh, you know, how how stealthy he was in trying to just make, uh, you know, have good relationship with the people because he said, look, I'm not going to beg for right riches and I don't know how to dig you know I don't know how to do manual labor basically is what he's saying so when I get fired from my job if I took care of these guys maybe one of them will pick me up and give me a job and I'm not there's more to that right and then he gets onto the the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he's talking about riches and what really stood out to me as you're reading this is if you go to verse 6 uh, verse 15 before we get into you know the points there in verse 15 he's dealing with uh, the Pharisees he's like well, verse 14 says, he cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, well, that's at the end of 13. He says, and Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. You know, they really, I mean, deride means like you're really angry at him. I mean, you, you want to just kill this person. You want to hurt them. You want to cause and inflict some kind of pain on them. You see there in verse 15 says, and he said unto them, ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. That's a pretty serious accusation. I mean, that's pretty serious uh, admonition, right? He says, The law and the prophets were until John, since, the since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth it into it. So when is he saying that the, the, the gospel has been preached? He says, The law and the prophets were until John. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. So we're just going to dissect this for what it's for what it is. For the story and before he gives the story, he talks about how look, you guys are you're so worried about your riches and your position in life and he says, "Look, if you're highly esteemed among men, that's an abomination in the sight of God." So when we're talking about false religions and then specifically today, you know, I'm going to pick I'm going to choose to talk about Seventh Day Adventists cuz I was taught that this was a parable. I also was taught growing up that when it said, fear not him who can take your body, but him who can take your body and soul, that that person was Satan. You know, these are doctrines that are out there that are taught by false religions. These are things that I grew up believing. I thought this was the actual, and all these things had me on the path to destruction because the Bible says you're condemned already. And so if we just keep your fingers there, we're going to jump around, but really we're going to be in Luke 16. So you're welcome to join me in the other uh, uh, verses, but you know when we look at there, verse 19 says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fair sumptuously every day. So the first point that we learn from this parable, I mean this parable, see there you go, that's how you know I've been studying this a lot. The first of this actual event is that comfort distracts from reality. You know, one of the challenges, I was just talking about that recently, uh, maybe I don't know if it was last Sunday or, or just a couple weeks ago was the fact that this country has done a disjustice to to its own citizens in the sense that we keep advancing technology to where everything's so comfortable. You know, nobody really suffers pain. If you if you have pain, you go buy Tylenol or ibuprofen. You know, if, if you're hot, you turn on the AC. If you're cold, you turn on the heater. If uh, if your shoes hurt, you go to Doctor Scholl's. You know, if your back hurts, you go to the back doctor. If you go you, nobody ever really suffers anymore. Everything's comfortable. You get in a car, people complain. You know, you, you get in a car, you got to sit in traffic for, for five minutes longer than you were supposed to, and everybody's like, you know, it's called road rage. You know, people lose their temper. You know, your internet goes down for 10 minutes. Man, God forbid the internet go down because 
what are you going to do without YouTube and Netflix and Facebook? And I mean, what did people do before the internet? Really? I mean, what did you guys do? You are, maybe you can tell me later because obviously we don't know. But that's the reality of things. People live in a, such a state of anger and angst and depression. Comfort de distracts from the reality. You know, we live in such a backwards, Cinderella type world. People get all uh, up in arms about the stupidest things. You know, I mean, you see it all the time. People cry over just about anything except the reality of things. But don't talk to people about hell because, man, you, you're, that's offensive. Don't talk to people about hell because you don't understand God. You don't understand that he's a loving God. But the Bible talks about hell. I mean, the Bible talks about hell all the time. It talks about hell from the very beginning. I mean, we see this in, throughout, and I'm going to show you this, but here we see that, and I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. You can stay in Luke if you want to. You can come with me. Uh, if you want to go to the longer scripture, I'm going to be in Matthew 19. But in Luke 20, just a couple of chapters later, verse 46, Jesus again talks about those riches. He says, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the high seats in the synagogue and the chief rooms at feast, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive the greater damnation. And we know what that greater damnation is. That's an eternal hell of suffering, of wailing, of gnashing of teeth. And we see it. I mean, we even see it in our government. You know, if you go to the courthouses, even to this day, what does a judge wear? A long robe, right? All rise, judge so-and-so's coming in. And they have, I mean, they just love that attention. You know, I, I mean, I served in, as a chief of staff for the city of Houston for a couple of years, and I went to a lot of these dinners. And, it, and I mean, I hated going to the dinners. I would try to show up late because the first 20 minutes, it's all about, oh, we'd like to thank honorable so-and-so and mayor so-and-so and mayor. So How many mayors are in the room? Because you have the acting mayor, but then you also have to recognize all the old mayors. You know, mayor so-and-so, and senator so-and-so, and house of representatives so-and-so. And, oh, so-and-so couldn't be here, but we still want to honor them. You know, they'd have to make sure that, what, they were highly esteemed among men. God says that's an abomination. You know, we, we, you'd go through that, but that's what, they're so comfortable in that world, they're distracted from the reality. Go to Matthew 19, verse 16, it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? We all know this, this occurrence between Jesus and this rich guy, right? He says, and he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus saith, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt commit, not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? Jesus saith unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell thou that thou hast, and give to the poor, that thou shalt set, have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus saith unto him, said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto him, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You know, I love the end of that because I used to, you know, I've heard that quoted whenever you're, going through something difficult in life and and by the way that has that application but for me I mean the greatest application is the only way it's possible is through Jesus Christ he made the supernatural uh, event of his death burial and resurrection that miraculous taking of his own life and then bringing it being resurrected you know and ascending into the the right hand of the father and you know leaving us the comforter that's why he can do all things Besides, I mean, that's not the only reason why. We don't understand everything. God, the Bible tells us his ways are higher than our ways, but that's a great way. So the comfort, that's the first one we see distracts from the reality. I mean, we see that this rich man, he's I mean, he has comfortable clothes. He's in the best of the best, and he, he eats well, he lives well. You know, he's not concerned about the things of this world because he's got money, you know, from the sound of it, he's got plenty of money. 
And you, and you living in Houston, we meet people like that all the time, right? I mean, there's a lot of billionaires in Houston. And then on top of that, there's a lot of millionaires in Houston. Houston's one of the wealthiest cities in the country, in the nation, uh, to say the least. And these people, according to this, are going to have a hard time going into heaven. The Bible says broad is the gate, right? The second point we find there in Luke 16, verse 20, it says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And obviously, if we were to continue reading, which we will, I just don't want to get ahead of my point, but he's taken up by angels into the bosom of, of uh, Abraham's bosom. So we know that this individual saved. At some point, somebody gave him the gospel. And the, the second point is that the poor are more receptive. You know, you, you, at, you wonder, we're a small soul winning team here at this school, I mean, at this church, the school, at this church, we have a so, small soul winning group. That's fine. You know, well, we got to make do with what we have. So that's why we go into the poor neighborhoods first. Because that's where we're going to get the most bang for our buck. You know, if I go into, sometimes Pastor Cobb's been with us where we'll go into, uh, uh, you know, these low end uh, apartment complexes and you know, I'll get six or seven kids in a row and I'll, you know, you get six or seven salvations once you go through, all, through each one of the children, right? Or maybe you get a house full. But when we've gone, he also has been with me when we went. Uh, I remember Brother Rudolph and uh, like a year ago. Remember when we went to that nice neighborhood? I don't even think anybody got saved. I was like, no, 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 thank you. I don't care. As a matter of fact, that's where we got one of the, the saddest responses. I don't care what happens to me when I die. I don't care that I'm going to go to hell for all eternity. I'm going to burn in hell. And the reason people don't care is because there's an attack on hell. There's an attack on the doctrine of hell. There's an attack. I mean, here, I'm not going to go into it right now because I, I was reading and I'm actually going to probably do a whole other sermon just on this. And this guy is from Houston, let alone. This is an article that uh, I was just doing research on, on why people believe in annihilation and, and soul sleep and all that stuff. And this is an article published May 13, 2016 from the National Geographic. This is from, I think it was one of their, their in their one of their magazines or whatever. And it says, the campaign to eliminate hell. And the article's talking about how, you know, 71, per, uh, in the last 20 years, Americans who believed in a fiery down under has dropped from 71% to 58%. That's in 2016, so I can only imagine what it is now. That's four years ago. But the thing that really got my attention, so that's why I didn't even go through the rest of the article. I'm going to read it for later, but... It says here, uh, it's, it's giving you a quotation. It says, what if the muting of hell, this is from a book by an author. I'm going to give you that information. It says, what if the muting of hell is due neither to emotional weakness nor, nor loss of gospel commitment? Writes Edward Fudge, who, whose 1982 book, The Fire That Consumes, is widely regarded as the scholarly work that jump-started the current debate. What if the biblical foundations thought to endorse unending conscious torment are less secure that, ha than, that has been widely supposed? So then I, I followed the link. I looked up this guy, Edward Fudge. I don't know, has anybody ever here in Houston heard of the Lanier Law Firm? You have. If you haven't, it's okay. Just look it up. It's one of the biggest law, per, like single law firms, uh, what I mean, uh, single practice law firms, one of the biggest in Houston. They have a, they're right there off of the Beltway. The reason that guy's famous is because he ran the, he might still be running, his name's uh, Lanier, L-A-N-E-R. He runs one of the biggest Sunday schools in Houston. They're at uh, uh, Champions Forest uh, Baptist, right? Well, this is one of the lawyers that worked at that law firm. And he ran one of the biggest Sunday schools of his non-denominational church. This guy who attacked the doctrine of hell and started the debate that made it into, you know, the National Geographic. Basically, we're in a city that doesn't even believe in the doctrine of hell. Some of the biggest contemporary churches hold on to this guy. I, I was just reading, you know, he was, he was quoting all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, articles and emails and Cambridge University and this university. Because he's a lawyer, so they gave him, a, you know, even more uh, uh, recognition. 
Well, it turns out when I went to his website, guess what? He he went he went uh, he died recently. He just passed away. He's an older gentleman. I mean, he obviously wrote this in 1982. And I thought to myself, neither can he pass to us. You know, a guy that attacked the doctrine of hell all his life is probably now there. Because people don't like when you say with certainty. I feel with certainty that anybody who would attack such a doctrine is not there because they never even believed in the gospel of Jesus. The reason that you, like, sometimes people get saved just for the simple reason they don't want to go to hell. I've heard people say, you know why I got saved? I just didn't want to go to hell. I mean, the fear of hell is so real to some people. They're like, you know what? That's why I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible never says you got to understand the whole Bible. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus went to hell. It says his soul was not left in hell. Neither his body did, uh, did see corruption. So the poor are, are, are more receptive. This guy had all, he went, this is a lawyer from a big law firm who was well recognized. He was probably clothed in purple and fine linen. We would call it $3,000 Armani suits today, right? He fared sumptuously. Houston's great. If you got money, man, you, you can end up eating some really good restaurants. I mean, my wife and I, we've done it, you know, maybe once or twice. We like going to Taste of Texas. But, you know, it's not, it's not, an, eat, it's, it's not an everyday meal you're going to eat. And you fare sumptuously at the Taste of Texas. And you get a big steak. You get to go to the back. And they have all the steaks butchered for you, right? And then you get to pick your own steak. And they have the big salad bar. They bring all the butter and the rolls. I mean, I'm just, I'm not, I, if you guys are hungry, I'm sorry. I'll stop. But go to Matthew 5 real quick. Keep your thumb there in, in Luke 16. So we see that the comfort distracts from the reality. That's why we don't go to... Now, we need to preach the gospel to everybody. But we need to also stand in the reality that we're not just going to reach everybody. And that not everybody's going to be receptive the poor are more receptive, and the Bible tells us that in Matthew 5, this is that famous uh, scripture in the Bible, it says, in verse number 2, he says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, this is Jesus, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. See, so you got to have a humble spirit. you got to have a poor spirit to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because it's not until you humble before yourself before the Lord, you know, what's one of the biggest reasons people don't get saved? It's pride. One of the biggest reasons people won't pray with us sometimes is pride. I'll take someone through the entire gospel presentation. They understand it. They agree with it. But so-and-so, their best friends there, and that peer pressure to not be embarrassed in front of their friends will stop them from praying with us. Stops them from believing on the Lord. Because, you know, we like to firm it up. Now, I'm not saying that that's not possible. They wouldn't do it later. But, you know, the reality of things is the first time you do something, you need someone to coach you through it. It's not like you were just born with the ability to understand the gospel and then accept Jesus. Someone had to preach you the gospel. Especially with all the stuff that's out there that can confuse somebody, right? So we see there, and it just continues, right? Now I see this list it's so differently. It says in verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Man, we're going to mourn if we're saved in Christ. There's going to be a tax. It says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I mean, there's nothing sweeter than the Word of God. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that fills you more than the Word. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You can't learn mercy if you're not saved. I mean, you can have a, a semblance of mercy. The world has some attributes, moral attributes that the Bible talks about. But that doesn't make them righteous because nobody, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Just because I can act moral at times, you know what? I'm also acting immoral at times. That not every time I do good, it, it, it cancels out the bad. As a matter of fact, I don't know that any time you do good, it cancels out the bad. The only thing that cancels out anything or covers is the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, if I'm doing good as a righteous, saved individual, that covers a multitude of sins, right? If I bring, if I bring it to... But if I'm just doing it to pat myself on the back... If I go to a brother in Christ, you know, or I mean, if I just go to a brother, if, a safe per, if an unsafe person goes to someone based on those Bible verses, all they're doing is just patting themselves on the back. I mean, even this guy, the young rich ruler, he says, man, I did all these things. And that impressed Jesus one bit. He says, and you know, he called them out because he knew that his heart was in the wrong place. There uh, we see, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding, exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know why they persecute you? Because you tell them that there's a hell. See, this is persecution or a form of it. When there's a campaign to eliminate hell, that's persecution. You know, go and talk to a good Adventist and, and they'll get mad that you tell them there's an eternal hell. Because they just can't believe that. You know, it's funny how people are just so much more righteous than God all the time. You know, I don't understand how God can be so loving and send you to hell for all eternity. I don't understand how you don't understand God when the Bible's so clear about the doctrine of hell. I mean, really, I think the problem that these individuals have is that they think they know better than God. We've all done it, even if we don't think we've done it. Because that's the biggest challenge. You know, what, what, what was Lucifer's initial sin? What, what was the, the biggest challenge? That he wanted to be like God, like the Most High. You know, whenever we're separated from God in any form or way, when I mean when we're in the flesh, when we think we, you know what we're saying? Is that we, we think we know better. We're, we're trying, it's a semblance of wanting to be like a God. I'm not saying you, you wake up in the morning, you're like, how am I going to be like God today? How am I going to do these things so that I can, no, you, you, that's not what it is. It's, that's, in, that's our sin nature. That's in, in, in the uh, corruptible blood. That's why we need Jesus Christ. That's why we need the blood of Jesus Christ because we walk around doing all kinds of things that are contrary to the word of God. And what happens is if people don't stand on the word of God, we end up with, with doctrines like this. You know, I, I followed this trail for a little bit and it's, it's stupid the things that they say. I mean, if you just read the word, look, we either believe this word to be true or we're going to follow the trails these guys. The doctrine of hell was introduced because of this. And guess who introduces all these doctrines, supposedly? These Catholics and these Calvinists. It's never a Baptist, because the Baptist knows that they got their doctrine from the Word of God. The Bible says, Thy word is settled for in heaven forever. I mean, it's amazing the things that are going on. And even, even in this, right before he gets to this occurrence, in Luke 7, 16, 17, you don't have to turn there because we're, we're going to move down, or you can go back to Luke. But it says, It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Look, if God says nothing's gonna, his law is not going to fail, then we know that hell is real. And we know that it's eternal. And we know that it's a never-ending torment, day and night, forever and ever. You know, the third point we find there in verse 22, it says, And it came to pass, in, in Luke 16, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off in Lazarus' bosom. Heaven and hell are immediate destinations. It's, it, this is it. There is no trial run. You know, that's why I don't like video games. Because video games give you a false, it's a false gospel. You say, man, you're really taking this out of context. Really? I played a lot of video games. There's a game that I like. Maybe you guys never played it. But when I was young, there was a game called Super Contra. And the, I loved it. And if, if somebody listens to this and they think I got it wrong, I maybe. But it was up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A. If you put that in before the game started, you got 99 lives. Meaning you would die somewhere in the game and you would just come back to life right away. And you die and you come. You never, there was no consequences for your actions. That's an elimination of these doctrines. And so people don't believe in stuff because the, bio, the devil's been brainwashing society for ages. You know, it started with the radio and then came television and then came the internet and then came video games and then comes virtual and then comes whatever's coming next. It's, it, the, the attack is constant. And it's all just to blur the lines. It's to make it cool. You know, I think, I remember a few years back, I, I, I haven't played video games in a long time, so I don't know all the video games out there, but I know that there's titles, like there's a title for a video game called Diablo, which means the devil. 
and it makes you want to be, if, 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 if I understand the game correctly, you take on one of the forms of the bad guys. You know, you, you end up thinking that that's okay. And so you hear things like people say, oh, you know, I'll just see you in hell. Or I know I'm going to go to hell. You know, we'll just party down there. It's no party. It's no party when you're in hell. Heaven and hell are immediate destinations. We see that. Go to, uh, go to number 16. And I'm going to the Old Testament for a reason. Because I'm about to, you know, decimate this Adventist doctrine that doesn't believe that hell is hell and that they believe that this is a parable. First of all, Jesus was always very clear when he was giving you a parable. But in number 16, verse 28, it says, And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all the works, for I have not done, for I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertaineth, uh, appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. By the way, the word pit, not every time, but a lot of times, is used to reference hell. You know, the Bible says, And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. See, they, they got humbled real quick. Everybody that saw it realized the reality of what was going on. You know, I, I believe maybe a lot of people that weren't saved at that time probably got saved. They, they just wanted to avoid hell. Here, the sons of Korah, you know the story. They, they went up against Moses. And what does God do? His punishment? He sends them to hell immediately. I don't have time to go into, you know, the Bible speaking of hell is at the core of the earth. I don't have time to go into all. There's so many things, you know, that's why we, we preach so much on the Word of God. And I don't want to get distracted, but it's immediate. God didn't waste any time with them. Now, even the people that die that are condemned to hell, they go to hell immediately or the ones that go to heaven. But he's given us, I think this is a very visual example just so that there was no, there was no room for argument. I mean, it's, it says it opened up, swallowed them up into the pit. Another term is maybe pit of hell. We've heard that before, right? That's wicked. It's from the pit of hell. Second Kings, you don't have to go there. Stay in Luke. But in Second Kings 2, verse 11, we see... And it says, And it came to pass that they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I combined them. That's why it sounds really weird. See, that's why it's so good to be right, to have the blood of Jesus Christ. We made. So I'm in Deuteronomy, and then I, I mean, I'm in Second Kings and Deuteronomy. The, and I, I didn't make a space. Second Kings two eleven says, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So the point I'm trying to make here, when don't combine verses, is Elijah went up in a whirlwind in the heaven immediately. Now, Elijah didn't see a physical death, but we know Moses, and that's what I was reading in Deuteronomy 34, 5, we see that Moses, it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes was, was not dim, nor his natural force abated. I'm using Elijah and Moses because Elijah, we could, you can make the excuse that Elijah never saw death. He went up to heaven immediately. But then the argument comes that when you die, you go to it's so sleep. That's the argument that a lot of these individuals, these false doctrines that want to get rid of hell make. So Moses, according to these false doctrines, would still be buried wherever he's buried that no man knoweth. But if we go to Matthew 17, and you don't have to turn there for the sake of time, it says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured 
before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. So Elias is taken up, and he never sees a physical death. Moses sees a physical death, but who's with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elias. So we know that spiritually, something happens to that soul immediately. I mean, Moses and Elias, this is thousands of years later, they're with Jesus. They have this moment in the Mount of Transfiguration. This is not like just a, a moment so that it, Jesus can make it look good. No, they were alive. Just like those people that are in hell, like the rich man, he's being tormented to this day. You know, I've made mention of that a lot. It really stands out in my mind because I was taught that this was not real. That guy, that rich man is underneath us, burning, tormenting, wailing, gnashing, asking to be quenched of his thirst. Even right now, it's an immediate consequence. See, that's the problem. The guy had all the good consequences, right? He had money so he could buy good clothes and good food. But the, the, uh, the eternal consequence was longer. And that's the next point. Consequences of our actions can be either temporal or eternal. And what really matters is the eternal. See, most people worry about all their day-to-day. -day, and they don't care about souls. They don't care about where that person is going. Or, or who, what they're more concerned about is if we're going to offend them or if they're going to quit or if they're going to, they're going to talk to you or if your family's going to disown you. There in Luke 16, 24, it says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. It's accurate with everything the Bible's told us. Now we know like Ezekiel, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule and I, I don't think that in that there's this conversation going on between heaven and hell. I believe this is a, like an occurrence just from what we're reading because the Bible tells us that this constant wailing and gnashing of teeth, screaming, but he's given us this, this occurrence here to show us what hell is really like. He says here, look how humbled he is now. He says, but Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And just real quick, just to, I'm not even going to touch it because I don't know that, that, uh, that, that when you guys were growing up, it was so popular. It's been popular in the last, in my generation, where people believe Abraham's bosom's like an actual place. But, you know, a bosom's just this, you know, your bosom. So Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. Like, if I give Pastor Cobb a hug, and then he grabs my head and he puts it down at his bosom, this is his bosom. You know, Jesus had one of the apostles in his bosom. Not, you know, just make sure that, that that's clear. Sometimes people try to read to, I mean, a bosom is a bosom. If, if you don't, if you've not, like, if you don't know basic English, just go back to school. Bosom just means this general area right here, right? Okay, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. That's why I'm not even really touching it. And he says, uh, 26, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So we see that there's this consequence that there's this real consequence to our actions. You know, when we knock on doors and people tell us they don't have time, that hurts me. It bothers me. And I, how do you not have time for the most important decision of your life? Well, the food's going to burn. Cook another steak. Well, I gotta, I'm going to be late to my job. Have them dock your pay for an hour. Who cares? Honestly, all of this is going to be burned up. It doesn't even have any significance if you're lost. It doesn't matter if, you, if you're not going to heaven. You know, John 12, 36, if you want to turn there, uh, John 12, 36, just keep your finger in Luke. We're going to close with, uh, and I'll get into the last point, but John 12, 36 says, While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be chil the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. The reason is I'm setting this up for the last, the last part of Luke. It says that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which, spake the, which, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, or to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes. This is, he's referring to God. He says, He had blinded and hardened their hearts that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah, 
when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless among, nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And so we see here this picture of this eternal consequence. Well, he's saying some of them, even Isaiah said, some of them were beyond the point of salvation. He said, so much so that God hardened their, eye, their heart and blinded their eyes. Why is this so important? Because we're going to get to that last part. But real quick, just in Mark 12, you don't have to turn there for the sake of time. It says, as touching the day, dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses? How in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Yet therefore, do great, ye therefore do great, uh, greatly err. In other words, you have an error because you keep pushing this false doctrine that people aren't going to suffer an, an eternal hell. And because of that, you've rejected it so much. Some of you have rejected it so much that God's blinded your eyes and hardened your heart that you won't even be able to believe lest you should be healed. And that leads me to the last point. There is a too late. This, the rich man, he had that opportunity. As a matter of fact, he knew Lazarus. I'm not, the Bible doesn't say that. I'm just, I'm just going to add my opinion. Maybe Lazarus gave him the gospel. We don't know. I'm not, so don't. But it's possible that a soul winner would give the gospel to even a rich man. I believe that the Bible tells us that we all will have an opportunity. He doesn't tell us how many opportunities everybody gets. But, so we knew he knew of Jesus. And he says it here. He says in verse 27, Then he said, I pray therefore, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Man, all of a sudden this rich man is real humble. Now he's ready to talk. He says, For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest also they come into this place of torment. You know, when people are evil and wicked, what's one of the things, what's one of the, the, the character traits? They want to bring others down with them, right? You know, when the AIDS epidemic came about, and even to this day, you know, these sodomites, these filthy sodomites would go around and infect other people because they were mad that they had this deadly disease, so they would do it. That's a, root. That's a fact. This guy saying, look, I know I'm here. I don't want anybody to come here. I don't want anybody to step into this. He says, I have five brethren. And look, if you don't have brethren, you're going to you do it to the people you love the most, your friends, your acquaintances. He says, I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. They have Moses and the prophets. Today would be, you have the King James, the word of God. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent, he's saying. I mean, I'm sorry, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, lest let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And that's going to happen. You know, the Bible talks about the beast is going to have a, a wound unto death. And he's going to come back. And instead of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're just going to fall for the, the smoke and mirrors. They're just going to be led astray. And this is the, the challenge with this, is that this is a real thing. I mean, the guy is so humble. He knows he's condemned forever. He's having this conversation. And the conversation ends with, send them to my brothers. Just somebody. Just It doesn't even have to be me. Just send somebody. He, notice he doesn't say me. Said, send somebody to tell him of this place. And he's like, they have the word of God. If they're not going to believe the word of God, they're not going to believe somebody who comes from the dead. You know, and in the last few weeks, you know, it, it always happens. It's just cyclical. I think it's, it's, it's just the time of year and stuff. You see, it, you, you see all these celebrities that die and people make a big sting. And then, but what really bothers me, I'm not even going to bring up any, I mean, you guys know what's happened in the last few months with several celebrities, but the, for me what stands out is, oh, well, I know they're watching me from above. I know they're here with me right now. Not according to the Bible. The Bible says they're either in heaven or they're in hell. The Bible says if you're highly esteemed among men, it's an abomination before God. 
You know, I mean, this is a serious thing. And, it, you know, I just found one article, and I'll close with that, and then I'll give you guys a <laughs> recap. But neither can they pass from a, to, uh, to us. This guy, this author for a, a Seventh-day Adventist website, just so you don't think I'm – this, he, he writes – and he's referencing this this Lazar, I mean this Luke 16, and he's like, perhaps the basic question is whether the story is a parable or a historical narrative. If it's a historical, then Jesus is describing what really happened to the rich man and Lazarus after they died. If it's a parable, we need to look at it as its purpose. Then he's like, he goes on to kind of give us both viewpoints, and I'm not going to read it all. I've just made two points here. He says, first, there's no explicit reference to the soul or the spirit of Lazarus or the rich man. So what he's saying is he's making the argument that this is not a real this is not a real current because he's saying that there's because he has his, he says he wants to dip his finger that his physical the Bible says there's going to be wailing and gnashing of teeth that's a pretty physical big attribute if you have teeth that means you must have a head I mean I guess God could put you in hell with with just teeth but that wouldn't make any sense that that's just not very logical from God right and then he goes on he's trying to destroy this then he makes the case for it being a parable. This is what gets me, he says, but why, this is what I mean by when people think they know more than God. Think, of, think about the arrogance and the pompousness about these guys, and this is why I get so angry. These are the guys that are sending people to hell in a handbasket. He says, but why would he use a story with such bad theology? Excuse me, I didn't know that you were, you know, Mr. Na uh, you know, English Nazi here on the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't know that you knew better how to write the Bible. I mean, think about the, these are scholars that are revered. These are people that run churches in this country and in this world that tell you that this doctrine doesn't exist and that you shouldn't worry about it. You know, the, the doctrine really becomes, if people don't believe in hell, eventually you get to the point where they believe in annihilism. And annihilism is just the, the opposite, is that once you die, you're going to have like basically like a capital punishment where, I mean, a, yeah, where you just get killed and, and cease to exist. And that's the consequence. Well, let me tell you something. For a lot of people, they would, they would take that consequence if it, did, if it meant not having to swallow your pride. For me, I think it's more scary and it makes more sense that a loving God would send His only begotten Son to die for the sins of the world and that your consequence for not taking on a free gift is eternal damnation and hell forever and ever. And you say, why, why do you say that? Because the Bible says it. I don't really have to. I mean, this is just one occurrence of hell. If I, went, if I really wanted to preach on hell, we'd probably have to have a seminar just called the Seminar of Hell to go through all the... Seriously, the Bible speaks so much about it, we'd be here for hours. As a matter of fact, I didn't even... I had The only negative about writing the sermon was I had a hard time staying on point because there's so many verses that speak of hell and there's so many examples and Jesus references so much and how serious of a consequence it is you know the Bible tells us that it, there's torment to day and night forever and ever we talk about that when I'm giving the, the, the gospel message it says and they were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone which is the second death which is another reference to hell but you know neither can they pass to to us I mean the the the, the thing I want to leave you with is number one this is a true occurrence. Jesus said it happened, it happened. This is in the Bible. We can sit here and listen to theologians give us all their theology and exegesis on whatever. This is what the Bible says. This is truth as truth can be. You know, comforts distract from reality. The poor are more receptive. Heaven and hell are immediate destinations. There's consequences to our actions, both temporal and eternal. The ones I'm concerned about are the eternal. Now, that's not to say that I've, I don't want my kids to like just go around stealing and being. But I know that if we put the right spirit in them, Jesus' spirit, then it's easier to guide them in the fear and admonition of the Lord, right? I mean, that's the way that I'm going to lead, you know, raise my children. And that there is a too late. There does come a time, and there are people that just they don't have any more hope. So we need to be focused. Okay, if there's a hell, and we only have so much time on this earth... Where are we going to put our efforts? Where are we going to put our time? We live in some of the nicest homes in, in Houston. Not the nicest homes, but they're pretty decent. The majority of those people, they're going to reject us. If we had two, three hundred soul winners, we'd knock them all out and move on. But we don't. 
So you know what we're focusing on? We're focusing on the poor first. That's, those are the receptive. And I love that. You know, it says Lazarus, he, he just would eat the crumbs. And I tell that to people all the time. Look, you spent all your time watching TV and, and you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you look at all these superstars and their money and their, their tour, their houses and their cars. You got better things coming for you. And they're going to suffer in hell for all eternity. So we have to really preach the truth. So much so that it, it causes us to be reviled, to be persecuted, to be attacked. I mean, we should welcome that kind of activity in our lives. And that's really what I wanted to end with. It's just, hell's real, and we need to tell people about hell. And if we're doing the right thing, then we're going to suffer the right... I'd rather suffer those consequences. Like Moses said, I'd rather suffer uh, persecution for a season. I mean, uh, I'd rather suffer with the children of Israel than to live in sin for a season, you know, with the riches and glories of, of Egypt. So 